the presentation of anarchism, anarchism. A social philosophy which aims at the emancipation, economic, social, political, and spiritual of the human race. The emancipation. Anarchist Essays is brought to you by Loughborough University's Anarchism Research Group. For more information on the ARG, see the link in the show notes or follow us on Twitter at ARGLBORO. Emma Goldman, A Glorious Undesirable, by Alice Beja. In December 1919, a rundown former transport of the U.S. Navy, the Buford, sailed from New York Harbor, transporting 249 Reds to Soviet Russia. Among them were two of the most notorious representatives of early 20th century anarchism, Emma Goldman and Alexander Berkman. Their deportation followed their arrest and imprisonment in 1917 for speaking against conscription. While Berkman was not a U.S. citizen, Goldman had been and was stripped of her citizenship in 1909, which later allowed for her deportation. The sailing of the Buford, which carried her back to a Russia she had left in 1885, seems to materially embody the paradoxes and pitfalls of national belonging that Goldman had to contend with throughout her life. It also invites us to reflect on the place of national frameworks in thinking about internationalist movements such as anarchism, and on the uses of national identity in their repression. The First World War has been seen as the moment of sedimentation of U.S. national identity as exclusionary, in terms of race, ethnicity, and political beliefs. The Red Scare, the institutionalization of Jim Crow in the South, the violence against African Americans during the Red Summer of 1919, and the passing of the Johnson Reed Act in 1924 cemented Americanism into an essentialized vision of a largely male, white, conservative identity. The sailing of the Buford symbolized the United States getting rid of those it deemed undesirable because they were framed as foreign in speech, customs, nationality, and political beliefs. To this indictment, Emma Goldman replied in a later text that she belonged to another America, the America of social rebellion and spiritual promise, of the glorious undesirables against whom all the exile, expatriation, and deportation laws are aimed. This essay seeks to focus on Emma Goldman to show how the framing of anarchism as a foreign creed by the U.S. government spurred a wave of mobilization in anarchist ranks. Goldman used the idea of America as a political and rhetorical strategy to counter state repression and broaden the reach of her message. Her texts, campaigns, and speeches lead us to consider the role of national context in anarchist movements, the relationship of anarchist immigrants to the countries they lived in, and the strategies they enacted to root their fight in their adopted lands while maintaining internationalist networks and beliefs. Emma Goldman rose within anarchist ranks in the United States in a context of heightened repression. The turn of the century was marked by a series of violent actions by anarchists or people who claimed to be anarchist sympathizers targeting prominent political leaders. French President Sadi Carnot, Italian King Hubert I, Austrian Empress Elizabeth, and U.S. President William McKinley were assassinated. Laws were passed in various countries to facilitate the arrest of anarchists, suppress their propaganda, and turn them out of the country when they were foreign-born. Responses to the threat of anarchism were also transnational, leading to the Rome Conference of 1898 aimed at coordinating efforts among European powers to fight the anarchist menace. In the United States, the execution of seven anarchists in the wake of the Haymarket riots of 1886 was an iconic manifestation of a widespread perception of anarchism as a threat to the very foundations of the country. Goldman became an anarchist following the 1887 execution of the Haymarket Martyrs. She entered the anarchist ranks through meeting Johann Most, a German émigré who was one of the theoreticians of propaganda by deed, and gave her the opportunity to deliver her first conferences. During the beginning of her career as an anarchist orator and agitator, Goldman mostly addressed German-speaking audiences and wrote articles in anarchist newspapers published in German or Yiddish. However, 
she soon realized that in order to expand the reach of anarchism in the United States, it was necessary to go beyond the New York saloons where German immigrants congregated and the Yiddish press, which circulated in the Jewish community. In 1893, Goldman was arrested for inciting to riots during a demonstration of unemployed workers. Imprisoned in Blackwell's Island, she started reading extensively in English, and, along with Voltaire or John Stuart Mill, she read Emerson, Thoreau, and Whitman. When she came out of prison, having distanced herself from Johann Most and his circle, she started lecturing more and more in English and attempting to broaden the reach of her message. This strategy was enacted through the use of the English language, as well as through references to U.S. history and culture, which increasingly punctuated her speeches. Goldman gave more and more interviews to the mainstream press, which regarded her as somewhat of a sensation, interviews in which she sought to translate anarchism for an American audience. Such a strategy of Americanization of the anarchist message was therefore dictated, to a degree, by political strategy, the need that Goldman and others perceived for the anarchists to broaden their reach if they wanted to have an impact on U.S. society and contribute to the social struggles in their adopted land. But with the heightening of repression, and especially after the assassination of McKinley in 1901, Americanizing anarchism became a political necessity, a question of survival for Goldman herself and for the movement as a whole. After the assassination, Goldman, who was accused of complicity with Leon Shulgos, was hounded by the police. She had to give up her political activity for a while to take a pseudonym and find refuge in places where she wasn't known. In her autobiography, she describes herself at the time as a pariah. The president's assassination gave leverage to his successor, Theodore Roosevelt, to enact legislation that had been discussed in Congress before but never passed, legislation on anarchism and its proponents. The Immigration Act of 1903, also known as the Anarchist Exclusion Act, barred entry into the United States solely on the basis of political belief and was followed by similar laws at the state level. Beyond anarchists themselves, who were the immediate target of this legislation, the act, along with other laws passed in those years, was the symptom of a growing desire on the part of the authorities to define American identity and ground national belonging in race, ethnicity, and political creed. Goldman was at the heart of this redefinition through exclusion, both as an individual under constant surveillance by local and federal authorities, and as the representative of a creed which was presented as foreign, un-American. Her strategy of Americanization took a new turn after 1901. From a philosophical, linguistic, and rhetorical grounding of anarchism in the U.S., she moved to more institutional tactics, which led to controversy and debate within anarchist ranks. The emblematic illustration of this turn was Goldman's involvement in the case of John Turner. Turner was a British anarchist whom Goldman had met in London and who had already made a lecture tour in the U.S. in 1896. He claimed to have come to the United States on vacation in 1903 when he was arrested for violating the Immigration Act targeting anarchists. In fact, Goldman had organized a few lectures for him to address the American public and believed that the arrest of an English anarchist would elicit more attention and solidarity than if he had been German or Italian. Having secured Turner's consent, Goldman decided to appeal his conviction to the Supreme Court of the United States. The case was supported by the Free Speech League, whose funds enabled Turner to hire Clarence Darrow and Edgar Lee Masters to represent him. The League had been founded in 1902 by a coalition of radical libertarians, anarchists, and progressives. It owed much to Moses Harmon, the editor of Lucifer the Lightbearer, an anarchist weekly advocating free love. Harmon, in the face of growing government attacks on free expression, wrote that the time is ripe for appealing not merely to the few radicals, but to the great American public. The League also drew members of the Manhattan Liberal Club, people like Gilbert Rowe, who was close to progressive Senator Robert M. LaFollette, and muckraking journalist Lincoln Steffens. 
The Turner case was the first major case the organization supported, and Goldman was named its agent to gather support and organize events to raise funds for the defense. Some of her comrades did not understand why an anarchist would go against a law enacted by a government she wished to abolish, and found such a strategy in contradiction with the anarchist doctrine. Peter Kropotkin was among them, and in a letter to Goldman expressed his doubts as to her handling of the case. Alexander Berkman also relayed to her the feelings of some of their comrades that her methods strayed from pure anarchism. But Goldman agreed with Harmon's argument and believed that associating anarchism with free speech was a sound strategy to expand its reach and to counter its growing repression. Through the Free Speech League, Goldman wanted to change public perception of anarchism and anarchists by decriminalizing their speeches and therefore contesting the pertinence of the 1903 law and by Americanizing them, showing how the anarchist practice of free speech joined with the American tradition inaugurated by the founders of the Republic. While Turner eventually lost his appeal, the campaign for his defense contributed to forging a radical coalition around issues of free speech. The Free Speech League would go on to defend Goldman herself when she was prevented from speaking in Philadelphia in 1909, and its commitments would be echoed in Goldman's magazine Mother Earth, which she founded in 1906. The June 1909 issue circulated a demand for free speech signed by leading figures of American radicalism, such as Charles Edward Russell, Floyd Dell, Eugene Debs, Clarence Darrow, and Voltairine de Clare. Beyond her own case, Goldman framed the fight for free speech as the foundation of political freedom and wrote, The only way to win free speech is to speak and to keep on doing so whenever free speech is threatened. No movement for free speech, properly considered, can be a temporary affair. The strategies Goldman and others put in place to fight government repression of anarchism after the McKinley assassination and the 1903 law were not only procedural. In articulating the defense of anarchism in the vocabulary of free speech, their aim was to rewrite the genealogy of American dissent to make room for anarchism, and in so doing, to radically transform the idea of the nation. To Americanize anarchism also meant, to a certain extent, to denationalize the United States, to craft an alternative idea of the nation, one within which anarchists could find their place and fight for their ideas. Goldman in particular, throughout her stay in the United States and after her deportation, regularly played on the idea of America, taking up a trope familiar to the rhetoric of American descent, that of the broken promise. Just like Frederick Douglass, Albert Parsons, and many others had done before her, she often reversed the charge of un-Americanism that was waged at anarchists by arguing that it was in fact the United States government which was behaving in an un-American way by violently repressing the free expression of ideas. In 1909, she wrote a new Declaration of Independence, closely patterned on the text of 1776, but which replaced the King of England with the American kings of capital and authority. In this way, she placed herself and her anarchist comrades on the side of the rebel founders of the United States. In so doing, Goldman also reaffirmed her belonging to the country whose authorities branded her as a foreigner, while never relinquishing her internationalist beliefs. In May 1909, she published a short, ironical text entitled Woman Without a Country, after learning that the government had stripped her of her U.S. citizenship. In it, she condemned the essentialization of American identity and the identification by federal authorities of foreigners as criminals. In the eyes of the government, she wrote, no American can be a very bad man. To this narrow vision, she opposed her own expansive view of community. You have Emma Goldman's citizenship, but she has the world, and her heritage is the kinship of brave spirits. Not a bad bargain. Many years later, after more than a decade of exile, she published another, much longer text bearing the same title in an anthology of anarchist writings. The tone is very different from the 1909 text. Irony and sarcasm are replaced with a more earnest recounting of the pains of exile. 
But in the same way, Goldman seeks to build her own community, based not on narrow understandings of national boundaries, ethnic identities, and ideological constraints, but on dissent and the freedom to speak one's mind. She writes that the America she feels she still belongs to is the land of the Walt Whitmans, the Lloyd Garrisons, the Thoreaus, the Wendell Phillipses, the America of social rebellion and spiritual promise of the glorious undesirables against whom all the exile, expatriation, and deportation laws are aimed, it is to that America that I am proud to belong. In reclaiming a tradition of U.S. descent, Goldman constructs what Davide Turcato has called an inclusive idea of nation, built precisely against those who had excluded her and many others, both materially and symbolically, from their conception of America. Goldman's use of national tropes and strategies throughout her life and in her career as an anarchist activist therefore invite us to reflect on the intersection between national and international scales in the analysis of anarchism. There was indeed a strategic dimension to the recycling of national imagery aimed both at making anarchism more appealing to Americans and at defending it from government repression and the condemnation of public opinion. But Goldman's attachment to figures of U.S. history and to the land where she spent 35 years of her eventful life goes beyond mere political strategy. It also rests on her idealized reconstruction of an America of the mind, her identification with the glorious undesirables to which she felt she belonged, while never relinquishing her own multiple identities. Thank you for listening. To help others find Anarchist Essays, please rate and review us wherever you find your podcasts. And if you're interested in anarchist ideas, why not check out the journal Anarchist Studies? For over 20 years, Anarchist Studies has been publishing original research on the history, theory, and practice of anarchism. For more information, visit www.lwbooks.co.uk forward slash anarchist studies.